Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, for most of you, you're going to be watching this on the video because it's pretty light uh, class load today. But I just wanted to remind everyone that your uh, half page topic is due on Stellar uh, the 21st, which is tomorrow. Um, if anyone doesn't have access to the website, you all should be able to log on to Stellar. And there's also been journal articles and other uh, materials for the class posted on the site. So if, no, if you can't access the site, email me or email Professor Eager and we'll get you set up. So a follow-up from last week's lecture, which was on aerospace applications. We talked about da Vinci's flying machines and the fact that even though he had many designs, uh, basically he was not able to implement most of them. Um, the materials of the time were mostly engineered wood as well as silk um, for the flying machines. We compared that with modern day turbojet engines um, and we did a case study on the surge stall conditions that uh, you know, lead to uncontained engines events in modern engines. Um, a follow up to that is that the turbine inlet temperature which is the primary characteristic that dictates what alloy of material the engine components will be made of because they do operate for the most part in the turbine section beyond their melting point. We also discussed the double hole vessel design and we tie that into a case study for the Exxon Valdez. So I wanted to, before we get into today's lecture, um, one of the things was uh, last semester there was a module on non-destructive evaluation where I talk about x-rays and, and compare it to current techniques for radiography. We had talked about the turbine blades I had showed you in class last week. This, uh, this is a digital radiographic uh, image and you can see the internal cooling blades and you can also see the dovetail connections here down at the root of the blades. So. We're going away from film radiography. Years ago, when you had parts, what you'd have to do is each part would have to get an individual film. Um, now you can actually put multiple blades on a single digital radiographic image. And you can also reuse that uh, about 100 to 200 times. Whereas for this, it has to be at a specific orientation of the part that's being inspected. Uh, there you can use multiple parts in a single shot. So today we're going to be talking about the human body as a structural material. Um, in the intro lecture we went over a lot of da Vinci's sketches that are related to the human body. So today we're going to try to tie that in with more of a biological structural materials aspect. So the human body is often referred to as the amazing machine. Um, current technologies that have really advanced science uh, with respect to biological engineering include functional MRI where you can do uh, scans of the brain and see actual different lobes of the brain light up under different um, response modes. You also have pet, can pet scans, CAT scans, which in, in industry is mostly related to computed tomography for aerospace and other components. If you make the corollary to the human body, that's if you've ever had to go get a, a scan done. A PET scan, CAT scan is similar to computed tomography. Uh, I want to tie it at the end of this lecture into some new techniques that we're doing. We're, we're starting a college of computing at MIT and a lot of the research, either NIH or other DOE types of research relates to neural networks and artificial intelligence. So I want to I wanna basically pose some ethical questions on this, the state of the science with you at the end of the lecture. But one case study that I saw that I found was interesting with respect to neural networks was they were able to take stroke victims who were not able to talk and using neural networks and AI uh, technology, they were able to train a computer system without with, with minimally invasive, just putting some probes on, to actually read the alphabet from stroke victims without them being able to speak. So this is really cutting edge where we're going. If, if it's almost that 
uh, you know, the technology learns enough and it uses Bayesian updating systems that it can teach itself alphabets and without even speaking, humans can now communicate with computers. So it's, it's quite impressive where the technology is going, but it does raise ethical questions. One of the things I want to discuss um, with respect to uh, aerospace and metallic components is the um, energy needed to penetrate. So at Harvard, they have um, CT systems at their Center for Nanoscale Studies. And I was basically the only person who was using that system for metallic components. So for biological samples, whether they were coming in from MGH or some other site, it would only take maybe one, one to three kilovolts to penetrate that type of sample. Whereas for aerospace samples, similar to the blades and discs that we showed, we're talking uh, 100, 150 kV. Uh, and at some, first, it depends on the thickest dimension of the sample. So the, the system there went up to 225 kV. And in some instances, depending on the longest dimension, you cannot penetrate a metallic sample. You need higher KV. So there's a big difference in, in energy required for penetration depth between biological sample and metallic structural sample. So we had talked about the Vitruvian Man, which was one of da Vinci's artworks. Um, it's famous artwork. It's not as famous as Mona Lisa or some of these others. But today, to tie it into the mechanics of the human body, I want to discuss the meanings of how the placement of all these body parts are done with respect to the mechanics and with respect to da Vinci's selection for his unit of measurement. So um, it is believed he drew this in around 1490. It was ink on paper, so it's very simple. It wasn't any type of fancy materials at the time. But the thing that's important about the Vitruvian Man is that the golden ratio, um, it, it's supposed to represent the ideal body proportions. So what we'll see in these subsequent slides here is what is the golden ratio? And da Vinci came up with this 1 to 1.618 ratio. And if you look at closer at this piece of artwork, he actually has um, broken down the artwork based on geometrical proportions. So you'll see up, up here that uh, the certain parts of the human body represent what's known as this qubit, which is this measurement that he's using. Um, from here, you have the, from his fingertip uh, to the intersection of a, a 90 degree angle here, he has it listed as a third of a cubit, but in subsequent slides, the other portions of the body from the, from the foot all the way to the head is broken down based on geometrical proportions. So I'll show you a, a video here, but the, one of the important things to remember from this is that he's listed the height of, a, of a, the ideal man's uh, dimensions as four cubits. And based on that four cubit breakdown, from the foot to the kneecap is one cubit, from the kneecap to the abdomen area is one cubit, from the abdomen area up to the uh, chest plate area is one, and then from the chest breastplate up to the head is another one. Similarly, when you start looking closer at the hands and the arm ratios, he's further broken down that measurement. So this is a, a quick video. The, the inscriptions on the bottom are in Italian, so don't worry about that. What's more important is as the video gets a little further along, you get to see how he actually breaks down the qubit. Um, so this is just talking about the hand ratios from, from the finger to the wrist area and so forth. So this is the four cubit dimension right here. As I said, it breaks it down. There's one cubit, there's two, there's three, and there's four at the top.
It was said that he based this drawings on male models in, Ven uh, in, in the area of Italy at the time. It might not be applicable to humans' uh, proportions today. Well, one of the things is uh, they've actually changed things. So with respect to seating chairs, they have standards. So there's a, a module on codes and standards. They used to use 225 pounds as a man as the value for a seating chair for loading capacity. They've now upped that to 300 pounds as, as the human population grows larger. Integrated as much with you know the Western European culture, you can look at people you know tribes where people are six and a half feet tall on average, or people that are pygmies and stuff. Their their ratios aren't exactly the same as Western Europeans. Yeah, so I mean this this is based on essentially Italians. If you look at it from a global perspective, there's some countries where people are taller. If you go to uh, Netherlands, they're they're taller than they are in Italy. So that so just for the, the point is the proportions are there's no universal. Proportion. Yeah, uh, for the people watching on the video, the question was why wouldn't the those ratios be applicable today? Um, the discussion is that it's it's based on a local population versus now there's variations globally as well as issues with nutrition that that change the the dimensions. Some other things to note in the artwork is with respect to the proportions. Um, so he divides the face into three portions. There's one area here, there's one area there, and there's another area here. Uh, and he has the forehead listed as a third of the face. So most people, when they see this, don't realize that there's quite a bit of geometry and mathematics involved that he did based on his work with cadavers and, and sketches of the human body. Um, this is the uh, Vitruvius's uh, De Architura is the work that this is stated in, and it states for the human body from the uh, chin to the top of the forehead and the hair, it's a tenth part of the whole. This is essentially what on the video w was saying in Italian. So it's how he broke down certain dimensions of the human body based on that cubit measurement. Um, as well, it's just, uh, this is some rules that he used in breaking down the cubit measurement. So to tie it in with the work that Leonardo did with anatomy. So most of his sketches were drawn even though the Vitruvian man was 1490, the majority of his work with human body sketches occurred 1508 to 1513. So he had thou probably one or 2,000 sketches of the body done in that five year period. Uh, at the time, because people believe, you know, had a more spiritual view, he was accused of evocation of the dead and necromancy for his work with the cadavers. Um, but he, he claims that he used at least 10, 10 human bodies that he examined. Scholars have said the number's probably a little higher than that, maybe up to 30. He didn't publish these no, uh, anatomical notebooks in his lifetime, and they actually sat unused for at least 50 years after he passed away. And it wasn't until hundreds of years later that uh, uh, individual William Hunter looked at the codexes that were made from these sketch notebooks. And following that, later on, there were select sketches published in the 1800s and 1900s. And more recently, there's been multiple books published based on da Vinci's work with the human body and anatomy. In particular, Kenneth Keel, um, one of his recent books is Elements of the Science of Man. So, even though this work was done hundreds of years ago, it's basically 
ha not until 60 years or so has it really been brought to the forefront um, and tied in with biomedical, biological engineering. So da Vinci's contribu co contributions to anatomy. Um, as I said, he claimed he dissected over 10 bodies to understand blood vessels. Um, scholars uh, in believe that that is actually on the low side and it was probably 20 to 30 bodies that he used to evaluate the human body. One of the things that's important with respect to mechanics is that da Vinci was possibly the first one to recognize the heart as a muscle. Um, prior to that, um, Ga Gallinus, Gallin was a philosopher in the first uh, 100 to 200 AD. And at that time, they viewed the heart as a spiritual vessel. So da Vinci was one of the first ones to look at it basically from an engineering perspective and say it's the mechanics of operation rather than it being related to religion or some type of spiritual view. Um, he also refuted this gallon belief that air was drawn into the heart from the lungs. So there, this is similar to you know Copernicus and people thinking that the sun revolved around the earth. All right, There's, the engineering studies that happened refuted a lot of these earlier beliefs. Um, so da Vinci did co contribute quite a bit based on his mechanical studies of the body parts. He identified a relationship between the cardiac cycle and pulse, as well as different uh, areas of the heart, atrium and other ventricles. Um, the final thing that was interesting was uh, he also looked at how the body changes as people age. So uh, one of the things we're going to discuss on the board here is structural biomaterials. This is, um, I can post this stuff on Stellar, but we ha one of the things as material science, you have to understand the, the length scales we're talking about. So when we talk about the human body, we are basically at the macro scale. So that is all the way over here. As we go to a smaller size scale, we're talking um, 100 to 500 microns for a tendon, which is in the body. Within that tendon, if you, if you look further within the subparts of the tendon, you can get down to a one to five nanometer feature size. All right, so that would be for microfibrils and tropocollagens. And as the structure of the muscle changes at each size scale. So one of the things that's important now that we have the technologies to evaluate these parts is to recognize the size scale that you're interested in, whether it is feet, whether we're talking about macro scale, somebody's height, or if we're actually talking about if we're going to analyze it with the scanning electron microscope, optical microscope, um, transmission electron microscope, or something else. So for, this is related towards people who work with biological samples. Uh, oftentimes the sample prep takes multiple hours um, because you're, you're interested in features that are down in the nanometer size. So da Vinci sketches of anatomy. We, I had shown you briefly some images of the human body in the first lecture, but one of the things I wanted to highlight was um, within the human body, he has identified tendons and muscles, and he's also looked at areas within the heart. So if you're looking at this image here, you can see the branching characteristics of the arteries and veins, and the detail to which da Vinci went and essentially diagnosed bodies and, and was able to sketch these is quite impressive for 500 years ago. Um, if you look at uh, modern books, one of the, some of the images we're going to show in the later slides are taken from this. This is a wall chart of human anatomy. The Da Vinci sketches are not far off from what we're capable to do with modern computers. So the mechanics of the human body. Um, as I said, Da Vinci, even though he had no formal engineering training, he, the way he saw the world was very, from a very engineering point of view. So he used engineering principles 
to refute these spiritual beliefs of the time. Um, one of the quotes that uh, I came across was, force with material movement and weight with percussion are the four accidental powers in which all works of mortals have their being and their end. So with, within that statement, he's referring to the pumping of human heart and blood moving through the body as a mechanical process, which it, for the 1450s is unheard of at the time because they did believe in the occult and they did believe in these spiritual things at that time. So da Vinci definitely went against the grain with how he looked at the human body. So to tie into specific systems of the, of the body, the cardiovascular system has three main elements. It has blood, blood vessels, and the heart. Uh, if you saw on the previous slide, da Vinci actually an analyzed the heart for these pumping characteristics. Um, the purpose of the cardiovascular system is to deliver and remove nutrients and oxygen to the cells. And one of the things to note is if you think of it, from an electrical engineering perspective, the, the heart basically has two circuits um, and they operate in a figure eight pattern. One is the pulmonary circuit, which is identified as the right side of the heart, and that is the oxygen depleted side. And you also has this, have the systemic circuit, which is the other half of the heart, which would be the oxygen rich side. And this ties in with the aorta, which is the main powerhouse for the pumping of the human heart. So if we look at these images here, they show the different, uh, even, even though the writing here is a, a bit small, it does show these two circuits. So what you're seeing here is how the blood pumps through the arteries and veins from the heart area down to the feet and, and through the arms as well as up to the head. Now you compare that with da Vinci's initial sketches of tendons and muscles, um, he also looks at the cardiovascular system. I posted on Stellar, there's a specific um, journal article posted on Stellar uh, about da Vinci's work with the cardiovascular system. So if you're in, interested in the biological engineering, then it's on Stellar for you to read. Um, there's some good information in that. But the mechanics of the heartbeat. So if most people don't initially think of the heart as a, a mechanical uh, operation, but it is. Similar to turbo machinery in a, in a jet or some other component, the, the beat is made up of three phases and it's timed and that's your cardiac cycle. So each cycle takes about 0 0.8 seconds at rest that varies if you're on a treadmill exercising. So um, if we're looking at this image here, you have the diastole, which is here in point A, all right, the atrial systole, which is point B, and that is where the two atria contract and squeeze. So that is the biomechanical movement. Um, and then in part C, you have the ventricle systole. So if, if you think of it in terms of biomechanics, um, it's the movement of these three parts and the syn in synchronous action of it. If, uh, I don't know if you guys are you too young, you probably don't have pacemakers, but when you get older, um, when, when the pumping of the heart doesn't keep up with the speed it needs to, that is when they actually will do a pacemaker and put it in, and pacemaker is timed specifically uh, and if the pacemaker has an off-time condition, then the individual will likely have a medical emergency event. One of the things I just want to touch on, we won't go into in depth, but da Vinci also had sketches related to um, childbirth and the uh, growth of a fetus in the womb. So I don't know if he actually did cadavers of a mother and childbirth, but he did have drawings showing the fetal uh, position and the, and the growth of a child in the womb, which I thought that was not something I expected to see for the mid-1400s. 
To tie this into more recent research and some specific research being done here at MIT, uh, around uh, about 15, 20 years ago, uh, there was Professor Subra Suresh who was in this department. Um, he did quite a bit of work on biomechanics. Um, and I, one of my former colleagues when I worked in New York was one of his students. And I want to, in the next slide, we'll talk about his work. And it, it was on what's known as optical tweezers. There was quite a bit of publications. But be, taking the technologies that we are able to do today, they're able to make mechanical measurements within red blood cells, which is pretty impressive. Uh, there's been quite a bit of micromechanical work on red blood cells as well as atomic force microscopy measurements. So when, when we say atomic force microscopy, we're actually talking about down here in this nanometer range. So that's when I, I mentioned the size scale is important to understand. Um, that's uh, those atomic force measurement measurements were effects on the central nervous system from traumatic brain injury. So for the most part, that was related to soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, whether they had um, post-traumatic stress disorder from IEDs or something. They were actually able to do uh, experiments um, to measure the responses to certain stimuli. Um, as I said, if you look at here, these are DO Department of Defense numbers for traumatic brain injuries from 2000 to 2010. Um, we have total over 202,000 instances, which is quite a bit. So I had done some research years ago, um, and I had seen some uh, technology. It's called digital image correlation. So that's a non-destructive testing technique. And um, this was down down in Maryland related to Army Research Lab work. They were actually shooting caliber weapons downrange at Kevlar helmets to see the response, the dynamic response at 5,000 frames per second at the moment of impact of the bullet. And the, the materials have advanced to the point that if a soldier gets hit with the headshot and has his helmet on, it will not penetrate the helmet in, with current technologies. But it brings this issue of is they end up having the force. The force has to be diffused. So the, it ends up being diffused through the brain. So it end, that's where you're seeing a lot of these traumatic brain injuries. So even though it's not a fatality, it brings up a question of is it better to live with severe traumatic brain injury or is it better to not live. So that's, that's a beyond what we're going to talk about here. But the, techno the Kevlar technology and the, the actual um, material technology has advanced quite a bit that soldiers can withstand uh, a bullet if, they, if it hits their helmet. Sure, but most, most of these are from IEDs and not bullets to the helmet diffused through the brain. But Injuries sustained going through, like on a convoy, and your, your vehicle gets blown up, right? And so, it, yeah. Well, I I have to go in and look. So most of them are from I, IEDs. That's that's where the more of the trauma comes. There are quite a bit of instances where people have been shot and survived. So I I don't know if you went and actually looked at the the um. This website here, it might actually tell you which one would relate to weaponry versus uh, a, a, a small caliber ballistic versus an IED or some other type of roadside bomb. But you're right, for the most part, um, majority is probably from IEDs and roadside bombs. All right, in addition, one of the other uh, areas is this GEM4 research collaboration which is ongoing with MIT and some other universities. Um, so the research related to the, the body is ongoing here in many different research labs and going to try to tie it into what you've seen da Vinci do in the 1450s. Uh, with respect to the uh, optical tweezers, so uh, 
John Mills was one of my former colleagues. We worked together in New York. And this is the, they were able to actually um, take the micro, micro mechanics at such a small scale that they were talking four microns, four to three microns, and, and measure a mechanical response. So this is not macro scale. This is micro, micro mechanical scale. And that's a difference between if you're doing work on a, a bridge or a nuclear power plant versus the body. You have to understand the size scale, but you can consider both as a structural material. So the muscular system is the next system I wanted to discuss. Um, and this will tie into what we talked about in the last lecture, if you, if you view it as part of a lever system. So we had talked about da Vinci's six simple machines, and a lever was one of them. So if the lever is a rigid rod that moves on the fixed point, that fixed point's the fulcrum, all right? Um, and then in the human body, the bones act, act as the levers, joints act as the fulcrums, the effort is provided by muscle contraction, and the loading, the mechanical loading, is part of where you're moving. So this, this, if you put it into a force diagram, that is one of the simplest ways you can break down uh, from a, looking at something as a lever of a simple machine to looking at parts of the human body as simple machines. So the muscles are divided into four groups. You have the prime movers, um, which provide main force. So an example of that would be your bicep muscles. Um, you have antagonists that oppose that prime uh, movement. So that would be your triceps. So the biceps and triceps operate in tandem as a mechanical system. Um, you also have what's known as synergists, which work together with the prime movers. So I try to put it as examples so you can think of your own body. So for synergists, it would be um, if you had your, your wrist and forearm moving, it ties in with your veins if you're trying to move your bones, your fingers. So the stabilization of your wrist joint while your forearm moves bends the fingers. And that ties actually in with your blood vessels and arteries as well because they're all interconnected. Um, and the final group would be what's known as fixators, which um, an example of that would be how certain larger areas of, of your body move. So the scapula motion with respect to the deltoid. So if any of you ever had shoulder in injuries, all right, if you, I, I tore a pectoral muscle years ago, and it felt like a heart attack. But one of the things they give you when you have shoulder inj injuries is these rubber bands where they, you have to go through a range of motion. And if you think of what you're doing with that, uh, tying it into these four groups, um, then it ties it into the mechanics of the, of the movement. If we're looking at Da Vinci's sketches here, he's actually taken these things into account in his sketches of both the legs and the arms. So he's looking at the uh, uh, radial bones tied to other areas of the arm and the entire range of motion of these systems. Uh, same thing with the, your feet to your knees and up to the hip joints. So one of the things, I can post these on Stellar, or, or if anyone's interested, I can just make you copies of these. Uh, if people do research in uh, biological materials, to, the choice of materials for implants has changed over the years. Um, a, invention of what's known as nitinol, so it's a nickel titanium alloy, is, is used quite a bit in hip implants. And now they're actually using um, more polymers within, tied in with the nitinol for the implants. Where is, the, is a major degradation mechanism if you put an implant in your body? So they used to have these implants, people would have to have two, three surgeries in a lifetime because the, the wear of the implant over time causes a gap. And when you have a gap with the implant, it essentially is useless because it's not carrying load anymore. So if you think about things in terms of 
biological and material implants. Um, this is quite a, quite a big industry. Here's some handouts. Um, if you, the pages that are, are tagged are the ones that are most relevant. So the skeletal system is the next system. Uh, has anyone done any research on uh, related to bones or bi biological? So one of the materials that I was familiar with years ago was known as hydroxyapatite. And it's, um, it's a calcium phosphate material. But what the overarching terminology is, it's called biomimetics, where they try to mimic naturally occurring bio biological components with uh, you know, what the, they can do chemically in the lab. Uh, the constituent materials that make up the bone, it's approximately 35% protein, and collagen is under that protein um, heading. So the collagen provides the hardness and the flexibility. Uh, the other approximately 65% is mineral salts, um, in particular calcium and phosphate. So if we think of the skeletal system, um, that relates to what we're seeing over here. So the protein area, collagen, you have collagen in your tendons in the body. And in that handout, you actually can see how the uh, structure of the different scales change as you go down. So here, um, for the subfibril area, you got 3.5 nanometer staining sites um, that's observed. And at the, at the 50 to 300 micron scale, you have fibroblasts and other, other biological materials uh, systems relevant. So the skeletal system uh, on the right is Da Vinci's sketch of the bones uh, from one of his cadavers. And you compare that, you compare the details of his sketch from 15, 1450s, 1500s with where we're at currently, and there's not much variation. So one of the things that was actually quite impressive for Da Vinci at the time was the level of detail that he went to in these sketches. To tie it in with non-destructive testing, um, x-rays are typically what an individual would do if they broke a bone. They'd go get an x-ray. Um, if there was a female and she's pregnant, they'd essentially use ultrasonics. That's what sonograms are, essentially. So to tie it in with non-destructive testing, in 1895, um, Rentgen discovered x-rays and there's, in, in a lot of engineering books, there's a famous image of an x-ray of his hand, um, which was somewhat serendipitously how they discovered the x-rays. To tie that in um, with current technologies, we've gone not only from this film x-ray, but now we can use both uh, the digital radiography as well as what's known as computed tomography to do three-dimensional scans of these components. So when you have a three-dimensional scan, this would essentially be uh, the cross-section of the, the equipment being used to shoot the x-rays. So you have a filament, cath load assembly, and it goes through this vacuum, and you have a water-cooled target here where the x-rays are generated. So if, if most of you do scan electron microscopy, it's essentially the same thing. It's just what what types of x-rays, uh, if they're not x-rays, they can be OJ rays, some other types. It's the energy coming off that depends on what the characteristic x-ray is. But I want to tie it into the human body because it is fairly relevant um, from a non-destructive testing standpoint. And you also see the same technologies used on large structures. So. If you're working on a naval submarine uh, years ago, they would actually do the x-rays at night and everyone would have to leave the site because uh, they didn't want anyone getting dose from the x-rays. So some, uh, if you look at the images from the previous semester, they actually have to do these in a, a 
about a three foot or one meter thick chamber that's that's uh, concrete to make sure that you don't have x-rays going out into a workspace area. Nowadays they can use phased array ultrasonics. They don't have to they don't have to kick everyone off the work site and they can also penetrate through thick samples. So that's the previous module, but it that ties into how thick, what's the depth of penetration for the material you're looking at. So for biological samples, you only need a couple kV and you can go through for uh, a one or two inch thick uh, steel alloy, we're talking uh, gig giga electron volts. This is just some information with respect to the vacuum needed to achieve uh, the x-rays. But uh, one of the things to point out is over 99% of the electromagnetic radiation is converted to heat. So when you you have less than 1% of radiation has enough energy to actually become an x-ray. So 99% is dissipated as heat. That's why in the previous slide, you need to have a water-cooled chamber. Some recent technologies. So uh, with respect to reverse engineering, for many industrial applications, reverse engineering is very important to, to make sure that you're your competitor doesn't have state-of-the-art technology that you don't know how to evaluate. The computer tomographies and x-rays are very important to the reverse engineering industry. Um, one of the things that I, I, I usually call out as important with respect to the software is if you're scanning this large component, whether it's a manifold for some, some type of vessel, pressure vessel or something else, Oftentimes, it'll be an assembly with different metal alloys. And one way you can determine what those alloys are is in the computed tomography, there's an option called segmentation. And that is where you can place bounds on the density. So if you think of it as x-rays are going through various materials, the materials have different densities. So the x-rays will scatter differently whether it's going through a steel material versus titanium versus magnesium versus something else. So when you, you can actually set bounds on the densities and it highlights where you may have a, gas, a rubber gasket versus some other metal component. So it's actually very useful if, if any people are doing industrial work. I think that's one of the uh, important uh, keys with respect to how you can do reverse engineering for large assembled structures. This is all uh, tying into, there's an entire scientific field of ergonomics with respect to how the mechanics of the body move. So one of the case studies to try to tie things into real life applications was the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant um, they call it an accident. It was a little worse than an accident. They actually had um, a partial meltdown of one of their reactors and a subsequent radiation leak. So it was not as bad as Fukushima, but it was the worst nuclear accident in the United States. Um, and other than Fukushima and Chernobyl, it's up there as one of the worst nuclear accidents in the industry. So one of, one of the things with respect to the nuclear industry, they are known as loss of coolant accidents, LOCAs. Um, if you lose your coolant at the nuclear plant, that's where you can have this meltdown. And once things start to melt down, because the environment's known as a hot environment uh, with radiation, you can't actually send people in to work on the, the control panels or work in the spent fuel pools. So you basically have to just let it run its course. And that is why with Fukushima, it took them about four years before they could actually send a robotic fish into the melted down reactor to take a, a photograph. Everyone basically knew that it was a, a full meltdown, but they had to actually photograph it um, to, for, to prove that it was a meltdown. And it took them about four years to design the, a robotic fish that could 
operate in that environment. So understanding the environment you're working in is, is very important, especially there's mixed mode reactions in the nuclear industry because of the radiation, how it affects uh, embrittlement of steel. So it, is, it can lead to premature failure of components. So that was back in 1979. Um, with respect to the er ergonomics, one of the um, issues in the NTSB report was that there was user interface uh, issues with their, their control panel. So they didn't actually know they had blinking buttons on the control panel and they didn't know whether it was a faulty circuit or if something was happening. And there was other issues with operators at the plant not knowing what certain buttons meant, you know, what their operation was. So uh, it's a, as a case study, it's, it's useful with respect to changes that happen in the industry because of the ergonomics issues. But from what we mentioned uh, in one of the previous lectures, they now have, um, it, in engineering, it's in the field of industrial engineering, they've actually done research and development on what the optimal uh, height and, and width for a person sitting at their desk working is. Um, and he, they have values uh, here as well. So this ties in to some of the work all the way back to Da Vinci's time. If you look at this table, you can see correlations between what he did with his anatomical studies with ergonomic studies of, of current, current days. Um, We had shown these force, force displacement diagrams for various forces on the body. So I wanted to tie that back into what we had mentioned a couple weeks ago. Um, if you look at this, there is some interesting ratios that they use for various parts of the human body. So if somebody's sitting at their desk all day, they've basically set um, good, fair, and poor thresholds to try to to tell people, you know, if they sit at their desk for 12 hours straight, they, you should probably get up and take breaks because it actually does have stress. It causes stress on the lower portion, lumbar, and other areas of the spine. So there is a tie, tie in with the ergonomics and, and the, the spine and the aspects of the human body. So I wanted to tie it in. Um, and pose some philosophical, ethical questions for you guys um, with respect to biological warfare and cyber warfare as being new threat vectors um, based on all of these new technologies that are capable. So I just pulled out a couple dates for people to consider. The Human Genome Project was completed in April of 2003. So that is where they fully mapped all the DNA and all, all the parts in the human body. All right, DNA was first used uh, as a forensic tool in court cases in 1987. Um, and then back in 1983-84, uh, with respect to DNA, they had first patents filed um, in, in the UK as well as in other locations. If you look in the news, we see all the time that things are being hacked into. And I don't, I looked there, I, you'd have to quantify it more specifically because the number of hacking instances since 2000 is so many. Um, but one of the things is if, if we're, all of these pieces of equipment are tied to computers and if you have a centrifuge, we are, if anyone's familiar with Stuxnet and, and Iran, the Natanz nuclear facility, you can do the same thing with the human body. So it's very scary where the technology's at. And it's, for me, something that um, it's, I don't know if you get in other classes, but we've opened a MIT nano facility, all right? On the other side of the river in Boston, we have a National Emerging Infectious Disease Lab, which contains some Ebola and some very contagious uh, viruses. 
We are familiar with what's going on currently with coronavirus in, in China. And there's some speculation that that may have been related to a virology lab less than a quarter mile away from where the initial hotspot of patients getting infected was. So if you can engineer designer viruses and you can control those viruses, if you know the micro mechanics of red blood cells, you can control these things. It's pretty scary to think that uh, you might be able to hack the human body. And there actually is already published papers out there where they've shown that they can hack the human body. So as a professional engineer, when you go and get a PE license, at least in certain states, you have to take um, continuing education credits with respect to engineering ethics. And not all of the people working in all of these facilities have PE licenses. And it is an ethical question that if you put something in an individual's body that can never be removed naturally through your kidneys or other systems, um, there's ethical implications and moral implications to that. Um, just to tie it in, it's, simil it's, it's an analogy to asbestosis. Um, there are a lot of shipbuilders and people working on docks years ago had got asbestos poisoning because of the aspect ratio of, of asbestos. Once it was in the body, the body, the kidneys, and the liver couldn't actually remove it because of the feature size. So if you can tailor biological weapons, we, we have the capability based on what's been published out there. It then becomes an issue of how do you defend against something like that? Um, one of the statements I, I recall is, uh, if we build bigger ships and we build bigger warheads, then a, an enemy opponent will go small. So it's we go big, they go small. So how small? If they can go small within the human body, then what's the, if, if they can turn on certain synapses at will, it's, it's something, something to consider. But um, that's why I want to tie it in just with some ethical considerations, especially since now we have this whole new MIT nano building and they probably won't discuss any of this with, <laughs> with the people using the facility. So that's all I wanted to discuss for this week. Um, next week, I haven't decided if we're going to look at more architecture or structural or um, some other type of weapons like catapults, things like that. Thank you.